Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Professor David Tizard and welcome to lecture number seven in, in this course on world history. Today we're looking at the Vietnam War. I've given you a reading which is a review of Max Hastings' uh, recent book, 2019 I believe, on, on the Vietnam War. What I'm going to do in this video lecture is go through some of the elements of the Vietnam War. I'm going to try to unpack some of what happened. And as I do that, I'm hoping that, first of all, it gives you a better idea of the Vietnam War, what took place, who the main uh, characters in the drama were, what were some of the underlying motives and causes, what were some of the important events. And as I do this, and of course, I'm not going to be able to encompass the whole of this huge war in one small video but as I do this I'm hoping that what we've done thus far up till now gives you a better idea of the difficulty of history now just imagine if we started with looking at the Vietnam War in lecture one and we didn't look at anything related to E.H. Carr to Hobbes Bourne to Harare and such forth. We just went straight into the historical events. That would be rather different. And imagine that version of you that didn't have any of the the Steiner or anything like that going on, the, the background that we've done. And imagine this version of you now that has done six weeks of more theoretical understanding of what history is. How would those two interpretations of this lecture be different. In that sense, that should allow you to think, well, what have I learned thus far? How has it affected my thoughts on what history is? How do we tell the story of history? What is history? Is history just economic, systemic based? Is history the development of homo sapiens species based on um, agreed upon fictional realities? Is it chaps and maps? What is it? Doing that, I think, will help you for the midterm. And I, I think it will help you going forward as well. Because we're going to start looking at, in this course now, more events in history. Trying to broaden your understanding of world history and how these things tie together. One of the first things we look at here is the Vietnam War. Pivotal uh, event in the 20th century. And we do it through a review of Max Hastings' work. Max Hastings is a historian. So that's why I gave you a review of a history book. It's kind of meta because you're not reading his book and you're not reading about the war. You're reading a review of a book about a war. Now, that becomes quite difficult because you're, you're passing a couple of levels of reality there. And I understand that can be difficult for you. That's why those of you with a broader understanding, perhaps once you've watched this, go back and read it again and you might oh, okay that makes a bit more sense now i would also suggest that you can have a look at max hastings articles not his books because it might take you a long time to read his books uh, but he writes articles he wrote a wonderfully scathing review of prime minister boris johnson in the united kingdom uh, a little while ago and this is not to show any of my own political leanings left or right to say that I like this or I don't like that. But in terms of the language and in terms of the way he sort of really took to task this character, Max Hastings is an interesting and effective writer. He's he's a best selling historian. If we're looking at world history, it's good that, you know, historians as well as history itself. Uh, you'll see in the bottom right of your screen, that is Max Hastings when he was in Vietnam, when he was in Cambodia. He was over there as a reporter. And so he went to these places. He was there during war and he wrote about them. Obviously, he was there in Vietnam. He wasn't there in World War One or World War Two, but he's, he's written about World War One. He's written about World War Two. He's written a great book on the Korean War uh, for those that read Korean history in English, Max Hastings' The Korean War, is definitely up there uh, with one of the best. So, historians tell history. History comes to us through 
historians. Max Hastings is a historian. So what does that make us? Readers of history? Because if you look at these books here, Max Hastings famous history books, and if you look at other books, are they books that, I mean, who picks up these books? Who reads these books? I have a couple of these books. I've read them. But do normal people read them up? Do historians write for other historians? Do historians write for normal people? Does the medium and does the audience affect the stories that these people tell? Hmm. I would suggest this, that if you're not too sure in the Vietnam War and you like watching Netflix and you've got a lot of time, this documentary is on Netflix by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick and it's fantastic. I've only got about halfway through it because each episode is two hours and it's taken me about six months to get halfway through it because I don't watch a lot of TV and Netflix. Uh, I'll sit down with a drink and watch an episode one night every other week or something and sort of take it in. But it's fantastic. If, you, if you've got Netflix, if you've got a bit of time, even if you don't have much time, you've got assignments that are just put it on anyway because it's, it's amazing. And this documentary is put together in such a way that you get first-hand interviews but you also get it from the Vietnamese side as well which I think is really important and some of the footage you're there you're in the war it's not just talking heads all the time discussing the war but it really brings out the visceral nature of it you can feel the heat of the of the the Vietnamese jungle you can hear the explosions, you can feel the napalm, you can be there in the in the villages and in the hamlets. It's, it's a, an amazing documentary. So if you need to broaden your understanding of the Vietnam War, I highly recommend watching this documentary on Netflix. That means it's free if you have Netflix. And of course, there are a load of other Vietnam War movies out there. One last suggestion would be it's not a Vietnam War, actually, but Aliens is one of my favourite movies. Not Alien, not Alien 3, but Aliens, the middle one. That was very much based on uh, war in Vietnam. It was based on Marines going into enemy territory and bugging out and not being used to the conditions and all the mise-en-scene and the language. And It's all based on the Vietnam War. It was taken and inspired from that. So uh, there's a good documentary if you need to fulfil your knowledge. Um, the Vietnamese perspective... And obviously my linguistic skills make it hard for me to read first-hand Vietnamese uh, accounts. So <clears throat> I did some digging anyway. Uh, if you need the resources or, or the, the links for these, I can give them to you. I'm sorry, it's not here actually. I should have put it. Vietnamese perspective. Most Vietnamese are too young to remember the day in 1975 when Saigon fell, celebrated in Hanoi as Reunification Day. Imagine that for for the nearly 70% of the population aid, under age 40, April 30 is just a day off from work or school. No one our age talks about it, Hien, a recent university graduate from Hanoi, who gave only her first name, told me, most young people nowadays don't really care about what happened. They just want to have fun. Vietnamese millennials have grown up without direct experience of what they call the American War, though many lost grandparents in the fighting. Those texts which, as Hen recalled, depict a hard but glorious struggle to defeat the American invaders present the official Vietnamese view. So just before we start, because I will be probably calling it the Vietnamese War or the Vietnam War, that's out of habit. That's also showing my cultural background. If I was Southeast Asian or if I was Vietnamese, then it would be called the American War. And so what you call it is already political. Can we just call it the war? No, we can't call it the war. Is an is there a neutral term that we can call this conflict? Could we call it the war between America and Vietnam? No, it should be Vietnam and America. Who started? How do? It's difficult, isn't it? Nevertheless, we'll come back to those linguistic difficulties, and we have touched on them before, I believe. Nevertheless. For many young people today in Vietnam, it's not a big thing. Vietnam still has a one-party political system, so it still has a communist political system in that sense. There's no 
democracy. There's no sharing and going back and forth between the right and the left or the conservatives and the progressives. It's not like that in Vietnam. However, they love capitalism. The people love shopping. They love wealth and affluence and they want these things as well. So it's it's not <clears throat> backwards in that sense. It's not state central controlled economies. They've got this capitalist system, but in a one person party, a one party system, very similar to China, perhaps, in that sense. Um, you can see here uh, from 1009 to 1840, if this GIF loads, it might not, I need to work out how to make GIF loads, but I'll do it like this. Started here in 1009. This was Vietnam. Here you have Laos, Cambodia. This is Thailand here, China over here. So this was Vietnam. This is Gulf of Tonkin. And it slowly came down here. Took all this. And as it did, sometimes it took uh, parts of Laos and Cambodia and then it lost them again until it eventually it settled into this very interesting shape. And this was what Vietnam was then, with this not there. But it, and you can see that the people were just following the coast down. They were stretching. Well, let's take this land. Let's take this land. This land. This land. As the years went by, they took more and more land, and the kingdoms of Laos and Cambodia and Thailand stayed inland. Vietnam has always been along the coast. It's been this coastal thing, and here is where the American ships would come in. Here's China. <clears throat> um, towards in the age of empire, as we've already discussed, as we've looked at, you should know the age of imperialism, the French took over this land and it was called French Indochina. There's the Gulf of Tonkin still. It'd be China. And they also took lots of Cambodia. This would be I'm guessing Siam is what it says there, which is the old name for Thailand. So French Indochina took all of this and it was run and it was managed by the French in their imperial. And you can see having these coastal routes made it perfect for going in, getting resources, taking them out, taking them back to France. In this picture here, Saigon, Camp de Mer. You can see a French colonialist looking like the sir that he is on a backwards chair in his white as the cam uh, as the Vietnamese sit around preparing stuff for him. This would be a very common sight around that time. You have the colonialists and you have the natives. And when you see that between South Korea and Japan, it's not perhaps quite as striking because the skin colours, the ethnicities are a lot more similar uh, than when you get French ruling over uh, Vietnamese. And you'll notice that it would only take one or two uh, to rule over a large group. And then you have to sort of ask why that happens. Obviously, it was barbarous, uh, putting people in stocks. This was a common punishment. And this is how that they would, this is how they would control people. This is how... They exercised their imperialism. In 1940, Japan invades Vietnam as Japan was doing its own imperial quest around not just the world, but the region, not just the region, but the world, I should say. They came into Vietnam and they used Vietnam because they wanted the resources. They wanted people. They were trying to do their own empire, their own imperial work, just like the Germans, just like the English, just like the French. And they were quite successful at it. I mean, they were quite successful at empire. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but if empire was a measure of something, the Japanese were doing quite well at it. They invaded in 1940 uh, and used it for their own purposes. So you can see that Vietnam until 1840, they had quite this nice big land space. They would have had their own country. They would have had this almost thousand years of their rule. And then they get taken over by the French. And then they get taken over by the Japanese. 
And then the French come back. You imagine that. They get taken over by the French. And then the Japanese come in. But then the Japanese lose the war because America drops two nuclear bombs on them. And it burns Tokyo to the ground. It, it firebombs the whole of Japan, or mainly Tokyo, and indiscriminate killing. Uh, it's very interesting if you watch. There's a documentary called The Fog of War, I believe it's called. I should have got the quote for this, actually. That would have been a good thing. And Robert McNamara. Uh, McNamara? McNamara. He was the Secretary of State. Uh, he was in charge of America's foreign policy and in charge of their military, essentially. And he was a uh, strategist. He was somebody that worked with numbers and information. He worked with data. He didn't work with philosophies and people. He worked with hard data. He sort of came out of... Mm, he came out of industry. He came out of modernism and capitalism. And he came in to direct America's war efforts. Now, he said, looking back, that what he's done, that if they'd lost, he'd be tried as a war criminal. His own words. That he won. America won, so therefore, you know, he's all right. But if it was looked at an independent or an objective view, the winners get away with, they can do what they want, and the losers they get the different treatment but he said that himself for his role in america's uh bombing campaigns uh, japan korea vietnam vietnam especially actually uh he'd be a, a war criminal for that um that was a little bit of a digression but fog of war is interesting and robert mcnamara is a character in this story of the vietnam war so there was a war for independence japan lose they get the nukes dropped on them uh, they get a lot of their land taken away. They have to go back to the island of Japan. It is very interesting because Japan lost, but they get to keep their territory, and Korea did nothing, but their land is divided. Yeah, that's how that worked. That doesn't too, make too much sense. That's worth looking into. Um, but the first Indochino War, 1946 to 1954, was a war for independence. So Ho Chi Minh, he wanted Vietnam to be independent and he proclaimed himself as president and he was a nationalist this was based on nationalism this war was not based on anything else other than this is vietnam we are vietnamese and damn it this is our place to rule so it wasn't based on imperialism it wasn't based on communism uh, the first war here was based on nationalism get the foreigners out this is our place that's what that was based on that's what nationalism is and the north was the nationalistic part and the south was not so you're getting this divide into north and south and interestingly they beat the french essentially the french came back and uh, and the vietnamese beat them and this was sort of turning the tides because japan beats russia in the the russian japanese war which, or, I, I think was 1895 i might be off on that but that was a real big turning point when Russia beats Japan, uh, when Japan beats Russia, all of a sudden the world looks at it and goes, wow, the Asian people can beat us in wars. That's never happened before. Normally we just turn up with boats and guns and we just bomb them and that's it. It's very easy. But Japan beating Russia around 1895 was a, a very big one in the first uh, Japanese-Russian war. But then here you have the Vietnamese also taking the French to task and the French they were on the allied victory side in World War II so they would have come back looking to maintain and keep their empire but where, where, where else decolonization was taking place other countries were giving up the French came back and those French are they're so cultured but they came back and they got their butts kicked Ho Chi Minh uh, studied in France. Ho Chi Minh opposed French and US dominance in Vietnam. He became a communist while studying and living in France. And he was an anti-imperialist. Uh, he won support of the Vietnamese people. It's very interesting to look at those top and bottom pictures because in the top he is wearing that sort of 
French look. He looks like he might be an existentialist philosopher and he should sit around with Camus, Sartre and Derrida and smoke cigarettes, drink brandy and talk about whether there is any point to our being or not. And it was in France that he became communist because it's very important to remember that the idea of communism is European. And you get these ideologies, these abstract thoughts that, or these, these theories, these theories of society based on abstract principles that had not really yet been tried out, that had not been put to the test. And what it was then, people would get these abstract principles or these theories and they would be, they would be smitten by them, they would be besotted by them, they would think they're amazing, and then they would go to different places around the world. They would go, Trotsky and Lenin, they would go to the Soviet Union and we'll try it here, and you'll get Chairman Mao in China, we'll try it here, you'll get Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, you get Pol Pot in Cambodia. These people would take these European abstract theories, these ideologies, and take them away to the other side of the world and try to implement them. And the thing is, the implementation of these ideas caused huge devastation. Caused the death of more people than in World War I and World War II. World War II is a disaster, and rightly we always honor and remember the suffering and the loss of the approximately 6 million uh, Jewish people that suffered in Auschwitz and other concentration camps in what was essentially a genocide but we don't remember with as much force. It's not put into our media as much as we remember people like Hitler or the Nazis. The, the tens of millions more deaths, <clears throat> just say what I said again, just so you understand the severity of it, tens of millions of deaths that went on in the Soviet Union, that went on in China, uh, that went on in Cambodia. In Cambodia, was about a quarter of the population died. Here, uh, I've just, we cover it in my political science uh, class, so this is going a bit off track. But Edmund Burke was an Irish political thinker who, for example, supported the American Revolution, but was very much against the French Revolution. <clears throat> he was kind of against the idea of the Enlightenment and what Edmund Burke thought when he saw the Enlightenment, when he saw all these ideas coming up, such as the idea of natural rights and human rights, which are abstract principles, he disagreed with them because he believed that society and people were based on the here and now. Society should be based on the traditions of a culture. And he was very conscious of the fact that abstract ideas shouldn't be brought into an alien culture because it wouldn't work. The cultures should respect their own traditions. The cultures should respect their own past. He has a very uh, famous saying the, along these lines, I'll paraphrase, paraphrase, sorry. Society is not for the convenience of the living. It is a sacred contract between the dead, the living, and those yet to be born. Obviously, Burke's work takes a lot to explain, but he was very into preserving the traditional aspects of a culture, preserving what had got the culture there thus far, because the culture in evolutionary terms had survived. The culture had got there. It didn't disintegrate. It wasn't attacked or it, it didn't disappear because countries and empires and cities, they do disappear. It happens. We, we don't have the Greeks or the Romans anymore. Uh, the Ottomans, they go. But the ones that do survive, he believed, Burke said, that we, they needed to respect those traditions and base them on the values of the people inside the country. And the values of the people in, in, in each country would be different. 
and they should follow the values of the people in each own country. But the problems Burke saw when he when you had people like Thomas Paine, the Enlightenment thinkers, when you had people like John Locke saying that, you know, we have th we have natural rights that are given to us, inalienable to us, given to us by by God, or are they every human is endowed with them. Burke said these are abstract ideas, and if you take these abstract ideas and put them into foreign societies, you don't know what's going to happen. And that's essentially what interests me with these ideas of communism, Marxism, whatever they might be, <clears throat> or democracy. You take democracy, take the United Kingdom and the US trying to put democracy into the Middle East. Oh, let's go there, we'll bomb them, and once it's all ruined, we'll put democracy in and then it will grow. But you know that doesn't work like that if you've ever tried to plant it it needs a lot of things for these if it's not compatible with the indigenous cultures and populations it won't just grow and that was one of the worries of burke's just seeing that older picture of ho chi minh uh, at the bottom he when he was in vietnam he then cultivated an elderly look he he specifically tried to look older he would grow his beard he would he would dress more frail he would appear elderly because it was a confucian culture and he would get more respect that way people would venerate him as an elder they would use affectionate terms of him they would see him more as an uncle so when he was back in vietnam that dichotomy between those two images is interesting because there he played up his age because of the culture it was very successful and of course there are not many people that have a city named after them that's a pretty big thing to have you have stalingrad I'm sure there are many more but that was the first one comes to me saint petersburg ho chi minh city david town doesn't sound quite as good does it um ho chi minh with kim jong-un sorry no that's not kim jong-un of course that's not Kim Jong-un, that's Kim Il-sung. And I just show you these pictures to give you a... I just find them fascinating to see the similarities in how they look, but also to see the continuation and to see the continue, uh, the continuity, rather. The fact that <clears throat> you do have states with allegiances. And, and North Korea, they, they sent planes during the Vietnam War. They... They couldn't really get involved in the war and Russia and China didn't really want to get involved and fight America because they had nuclear weapons. So it sort of became America uh, in the South Vietnam versus the North Vietnamese with Ho Chi Minh in that side. And they would fight each other, but the North Vietnamese would be supplied by the Soviets, by China, by North Korea. They would help their communist allies. So it was very much part of the Cold War. There are lots of photos out there of Kim Il-sung and Ho Chi Minh together enjoying lots of things. <clears throat> the French were defeated in 1954. So I, I think this is... You would be very proud, wouldn't you, if, if the imperialists, they came and they took over your country and they went away and they came back after the Second World War and you decided, we're going we're gonna to get you. And they did. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the French were defeated and they withdrew. They, they went away. They said, right, that's it. We're, we're done. We've been beaten. One year after the Korean War finished, the Korean War obviously finishing the stalemate with North Korea and Chinese forces not able to kick the Americans out and the Americans not able to overrun. You, you get this stalemate where things are just stuck there. The North Vietnamese beat the French. They got them out and the French left. So that story, that, that affects North Korea. That affects communist nations. That affects when people say, well, we want you to get out. You, you've got to get out because they got out of those countries. Because it worked before. It's happened before. And it happens with the French in 1954. And then it happens with the Americans at the end of the Vietnamese War. And Vietnam essentially wins they don't go over to america and kill the americans that that's a hollywood movie well it wouldn't be a hollywood movie but you get the point but th they get the intruders or the imperialists out and this is not to say that the vietnamese are the good guys in this story or the imperialists are the good guys it's 
but it's to say that that narrative, that understanding of history, affects and imparts itself on modern policy, on how people will see this world. Yes, the young Vietnamese don't really care about what happened as much. They have to just study it in history class, and it's boring. It just says, we're really great. Yes, that's probably what your history books say as well. Okay, but those decisions, those results will affect how people, how Kim Il-sung saw, Kim Il-sung was the leader until 1994. He died in June 1994. So for the next, what, nearly half a century, he would have seen that's what the Vietnamese did. That's what Ho Chi Minh did. That's what we're going to do. And he'll pass that message on to Kim Jong-il, to Kim Jong-un, that message will be there, not just in North Korea. I'm just using North Korea as an example to give you a bit of perspective. But the idea that sometimes the, the, the communists win or the imperialists don't win, are those labels helpful? Does that really even get us anywhere? Can we pull those apart? So after the French leave, there's a, there's a con Geneva conference. There's a conference where all the people come together and it was there were two agendas the first one was how to settle the end of the the first one was the korean war at this geneva conference the first uh, thing that they discussed was what do we do about south korea uh, about the korean peninsula in 1954 and there were korean representatives there were north korean representatives there were us china russia great britain was there as well just starting on this vietnamese one before we do a bit of korea in 1954, the French have been kicked out, so they created two Vietnams. I know what we'll do. What shall we do with Vietnam? Well, well, we'll divide it in half. Where? The 38th parallel? No, the 17th. Okay, I've heard this before. This was a really good idea last time, wasn't it? Why are we doing it again? They divided Vietnam. Vietnam was divided in half. Uh, signed by representatives from Europe, Asia and the America. South, uh, the Russians backed North Vietnam, which means Hanoi, which means Ho Chi Minh. The US backed South Vietnam, which means Saigon. And what they said is, we have these two Vietnams here. And then you'll have elections and you'll reunify in 1956. So we'll split you now, but in two years, then you're going to reunify. Well, we've already learned that it took them another two decades and another million, what well, millions of lives lost to unify. So they didn't reunify till the 70s. So this plan backfired. This is a photo of the Geneva Conference as it took place. This is how history is made. Or rather, it's not how history is made. This is how history is decided. So when we looked at Steiner, Zara Steiner, talking about maps, chaps and, and diplomacy, this is maps, chaps and diplomacy here. These people decide to divide countries. These people decide, decide to what happens at the end of wars. These people decide the fate of nations very far away for better or for worse but this is what they do objectively and then this is history because without countries being divided without backing of each sides without uh, different countries supporting different regimes we don't have wars we don't have trade disputes we don't we don't have division now, I'm not sure that we could go into sort of utopian thoughts or anything like that, but these meetings, these summits, these conferences, and this is Geneva 1954, they're meant to bring about stability and peace and all the good stuff that we hope. And the language at these conferences would be based on lots of lovely stuff. The language would be flowery. What are the results? The results are the deaths of millions. Is it because of these conferences? How do these conferences come into history? Uh, I believe last time, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, we looked at photos of uh, what Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin. This is the same thing. 
1954, this was said about the Geneva Conference vis-a-vis -vis Korea. So in 1954, at this meeting, and this was before Vietnam was decided, the Koreans went first. The South Korean representative proposed that the South Korean government was the only legal government in Korea, that UN supervised elections should be held in the north, that Chinese forces should withdraw, and that UN forces should remain as a police force. And of course, the UN forces were the American forces who were against the Chinese forces in the war. The North Korean representative suggested that elections be held throughout all of Korea, that all foreign forces leave beforehand, that the elections be run by an all Korean commission to be made up of equal parts from North and South Korea and to increase general relations economically and culturally between the North and South. So at that meeting, the South said, we're the only legal government. The UN needs to go into the North. The Chinese have got to go out, but the United Nations and America can stay. How about that deal? Well, what do you think the North Koreans are going to say to that deal? Of course, they're never going to accept it. Never going to accept that. So the North Koreans say, how about everyone goes out and it's just the Koreans here? Koreans didn't go for it. So the Chinese delegation proposed an amendment to have a group of neutral nations supervise the elections, which the North accepted. The U so the Chinese said, well, if the there's neutral nations, because it can't be the UN forces, because they were a belligerent. They were in the war. So if we get some neutral nations in, China says we'll get some neutral ones in, then let's do that. The North accepts. The US supported the South Korean position, saying the USSR wanted to turn North Korea into puppet state. Most allies remained silent, and at least one, Britain, thought the US-South Korean proposal would be deemed unreasonable. It does seem unreasonable. Perhaps this is not Kukbong, but perhaps Britain maybe had a point there. The South Korean representative proposed all Korea elections to be held according to South Korean constitutional procedures and still under UN supervision. On June 15th, the last day of the conference on the Korean question, the USSR and China both submitted declarations in support of a unified, democratic, independent Korea, saying that negotiations to that end should resume at an appropriate time. The Belgian and British delegations said that while they were not going to accept the Soviet and Chinese proposals, that did not mean a rejection of the ideas they contained. In the end, however, there could be no agreement. Korea remains divided. So it's very interesting in Korean history, and it, it's not something that perhaps, I don't know how often it's in your history books or how often you come across the 1954 Geneva Conference, but this was a pivotal moment in Korean history in that there was a suggestion that everybody leave and the Koreans sort it out by themselves. But the South Koreans wanted... United Nations forces to stay. So this could have gone a different way. The maps and the chat, the, the chaps could have made different decisions and then the maps would have been different. One of the big problems or one of the things involved in all this is what is known as domino theory. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower, the American president, he was the leader of the American forces in World War Two. Imagine that. He was the guy that, that's pretty Eastern Shin style. He was the leader of the American forces in World War Two. They won. They got to Berlin. They killed Hitler. They did all the good stuff and they came home and they kissed the girl. And then he became president. And what he was worried about and what the American under McCarthyism was worried about was a domino theory in which that one country after another will all become communism. So it's about stopping the dominoes. It's about stopping them in their track. Um, in Vietnam, there are two kind of forces together. The Viet Cong, which I believe in Korean is the same, Viet Cong. Probably, this is quite interesting, that Viet Cong is short for Vietnam Cong San, Cong San Dui, Vietnamese communists. That's how close the languages are, that they are essentially uh, the Viet Cong 
are the Vietnamese communists, and the language is very similar there to Koreans. Uh, the communists obviously opposed the South and the Viet Cong. They had guerrillas who attacked their own government. This is something that you don't really see too much in the Korean story, that the South, it's just like Korea, the South of the US and, and the Vietnamese and the democracy and the capitalism and the North of the communists. And that's how it was meant to be. But in the South, you have the Viet Cong. And in the South, you have the National Liberation Front. And they're communists, the Viet Cong, and the NLF, the National Liberation Front, they're nationalists. So they both have two different reasons for fighting. They're, they're two different groups, but eventually they sort of, they go the same ways. They both have the same goals of getting these Americans and getting these Vietnamese people out. Goals of overthrowing puppet regime of the South, liberating nation from foreign domination, reunify Vietnam, creating a more equal society. If you change that to Korea, it all looks the same. Um, Kennedy in Vietnam. So JFK is often, John F. Kennedy is often seen as the darling of American politics. He was young, he was handsome, he... he was with Marilyn Monroe, but he was also a drug addict and he was also a notorious womanizer or adulterer or had lots of girlfriends and affairs. How important that is, well, that's a different question. It, it depends on what story of history you say. But the, the rule in, in South Vietnam was not stable. The people there didn't like it. They didn't support the government. It's a bit the same with... 1960s Lee Sung Man in South Korea, the people kicked him out. They said, "We don't like you. Get out. We we don't support what you're doing." Uh, same thing was happening at the same time in Vietnam. And a couple of the biggest uh, pictures. So, the leader there, he wasn't sent to Hawaii. So DM, like Sing Man Ri, left with his wife and went to Hawaii. 1963. The South Vietnam leader was kidnapped in a coup d'etat and then assassinated. That's a pretty bloody story. You also have these, which is a great side. Well, I shouldn't say great, but a trigger warning. There is a, sorry, a trigger warning. There is a, a, a graphic photo on the next page but it's a serious photo it's a war photo and it won the Pulitzer Prize and when I was 15 16 I used to listen to Rage Against the Machine and this photo was on the cover of that album uh, so if you don't like the photo please don't look but uh, it's it's related to the Buddhist monks suicide protests because just a little bit what I was talking about Burke the South was trying to make the country urban it was trying to make it Catholic or Christian. It was trying to make it into a Western democracy. They were trying to make people wear suits. They were trying to make it like America. They were trying to get away the peasants. That wasn't natural to the South Vietnamese. That wasn't natural to the Vietnamese. That's not how they lived. Putting these alien ideologies onto the people didn't have a good result. And here's the picture. Chik Quang Duk, I probably said his name very wrong, but he became a Bodhavista for this. A Bodhavista is like a saint in the Christian religion. Um, and this was something that really shocked the Western world. Imagine how devoted you have to be to do something like this. I guess, yes, you have uh, in, in South Korea, you have John Tae uh, John Taylor was like what he's called, a, I guess, for any international students, because we do have some. Uh, John Taylor. Uh, and in Korea, they might call it something like a Yolsa, which is like a patriot, but it's more also like a martyr. And he set himself on fire for workers' rights in South Korea, I think 1970. There's a statue of him by the Chungachan. And he said something like, we are not machines because they were made to work in sort of Dickensian things. That's a sidetrack. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm 
pu pulling parallels a lot between South Korea and Vietnam, but this photo really had an effect on the Western world because this was peaceful. This was somebody, uh, and you can see sort of other images of it, somebody sitting down and saying, what's happening here is not right. And I'm not going to go and kill other people and impose myself. I'm going to get my friend to douse myself in petrol. And I'm going to sit here and, and self-immolate. Wasn't the only one to do it either. There were, there were many more Buddhist monks that did this. Many more photos uh, protesting the invasion of their natural way of life. This was not how they were meant to live. And they were, they were protesting it. That's a pretty powerful protest to make. That'll make you think. That'll make... When people in the West saw these photos, because it was the most... It was the biggest photo of the Vietnamese war for a while. It makes people think. The role of photos in history. Which is important because uh, Vietnam was the first televised war. It was the first time that war was on television. Now wars, you sort of get the Iraq war and things like that. And you can watch them. You turn in every night. It's like what we do with COVID-19. You wake up in the morning and you turn it on. How many dead? How many confirmed? How many have recovered? You're, you're looking for those data, for those statistics to see if it was better than the yesterday. That's what people were doing during the Vietnamese war. They were looking on, they were waking up, turning on the tally, going, how many dead? How many did they die? How many of those died? How many of ours died? Did we get any land? The role of photos in television and, and, and perception in history is, is very powerful. Now, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, there's, there's, there's books, there's videos, there's conspiracy theories all over this. Now... The Americans say that the North Vietnamese fired on their ship. Now, the controversy is over whether the U.S. provoked the attack or not. Who did it first? So this was in the Gulf of Tonkin. So uh, if I just take you back to this map, if you remember on the French Indochina one, you had American big ships in here. This is an American ship, just in case you can't tell. There's the Stars and Stripes, right? And a North Korean boat fired on it. <laughs> a Vietnamese boat fired on it. I get mixed up. Fired on this. Did Was it a false flag? Did they provoke it? Because America wants to go in there. America, does it want to go in there? It's got its boats there. It wants to do something. So, because that got fired, then the war starts. Because they fired on that boat there. Was that a provoked attack? Was that an unprovoked attack? That's still a big controversy. Um, in terms of photos of the Vietnamese war, napalm was a big thing. Agent Orange was a big thing. Please, there's a band called Agent Orange, and I went to look for them once on Google, and I typed it in, and I was greeted with the most disgusting and horrific photos of... Uh, young children that were badly mutilated and mutated from this Agent Orange chemical. It's really savage stuff. This was used by the Americans on the Vietnamese during the Vietnamese War, uh, the Vietnam War, the American War. They also used napalm in, in that they burnt, they burnt the jungle. They burnt, they burnt everything. One of the most famous photos. I don't believe I put it in this PPT is of the young girl running away from the... Uh, she, she's naked. She must be nine or ten, perhaps less. She's running away from the the, uh, the napalm attacks and she's badly burnt on her back. Photos of the Vietnam War, the television things. This is it. So it was a living room war. TV news broadcasts every day to talk about how many people died, how many people were living how many people got through and i wonder has this made war less possible now has it made because in the past you could go and you could do these wars and nobody would really know and and you could get away with it in a certain to a certain extent but now 
with TV, with media, with coverage, if you go over there and commit horrific acts, and maybe horrific acts are what are needed to win a war, how do you, you don't win a war nicely, I don't think, I don't think it's possible to go up to someone and go, hello, I'd like your country. Okay. Th there needs to be a little bit of killing, doesn't there? In general? And a population might not roll over too easily, so you need to do a bit of indiscriminate killing. Read Machiavelli. Uh, and so I wonder whether media and television has made that sort of impossible now. Because the tactics that are needed to win a war just simply aren't really applicable. Or if you do that, then everyone will turn against you. Everyone will say, well, you can't do that to civilians. You can't do that to innocent people. That's just not right. What happened during the war is that there was a draft. So America couldn't win the war. They were, because the war was in the, the jungles of Vietnam. And therefore, all what they did during World War II, where you would get these big forces going forward to meet the, to meet the Germans and such forth, to meet the Japanese, didn't work in the jungle. In the jungle, it was more about guerrilla warfare, people popping up out of the, the jungle and shooting you and then disappearing again. World, the previous wars were more about, you could see the enemy. The enemy's over there, we're over here. We'll fire, you fire, whoever's got the biggest gun wins, okay? Deal. But that wasn't what the Vietnamese war was like and the Americans simply weren't ready for it. And so they had to send more and more people over. And they run out of volunteers. So they had to draft people. What happened is they would draft people between 18 to 26. However, university students and rich people and, and, and people with friends in uh, good families and such forth, the middle class, the upper class, they got out of it. They, they said, sorry, I'm not doing it. I've got a special reason. And so the people in the Vietnam War for America were low income whites from small rural towns or urban populations and minorities and you hear some very interesting stories uh saying that when they went to the vietnamese war and they went to the army these americans they would say it's the first time especially if they're from sort of rural areas or parts of america they say they went to the army and it was the first time that they saw a black man it was the first time that they saw hispanic because where they were from, that, that that just didn't happen. There was still segregation in, in parts of America where the peoples didn't mingle. And so what America had to do was they were just getting all the poor, all the minorities. And there are statistics that say the black population of America at the time might have been 12%, but they were 80% of the soldiers, which was very disproportionate so as time went on there was a lot of resistance to the war locally and it's very interesting that a lot of the resistance and i don't say this with any disrespect came from self-interest because when it was just the low income uh, and the minorities going people were fine but when they needed to expand the draft and say we need more people we need university students and when white university students had to suddenly start going to vietnam then the resistance came so the resistance was more about self-interest than minority rights when it was just taking these minor populations the americans sort of the the rich white college kids or just the normal college kids said that's fine well, you know of course some opposed the war but in general, there weren't the big protests. It was when the, the normal people had to go. They were worried about their own lives, that these really kicked in. And that created this division in society. And I'm going to find this Muhammad Ali speech for you. I'm going to do some awesome editing while I pause the video and find it. Give me one second. Okay, so what I'd like to say about this, and I hope YouTube doesn't block my video or something for this. It's only a couple of minutes, but it's important to remember that Muhammad Ali was a world champion at the time. Muhammad Ali was, he was Sun Hung Min. He was, he was bigger than that. He was, 
He was Beckham. He was Tiger Woods. He was Wayne Gretzky. He was, uh, I wanted to say her name, but I've forgotten her. Kim, Kim Yong-yong, the volleyball player. Kim Yong-yong? Kim Yong-yong. Top on oh. He was huge. <laughs> That's my point. He was really big. I don't mean in physical stature, but I mean in terms of his celebrity, who he was. And he was told to go to Vietnam. And so he said no. And this is how he said it. Ali defeated Foley by a knockout in the seventh round. Immediately thereafter, he walked into the teeth of a monumental decision. He was drafted, and then he refused induction on the grounds of his religious convictions on war. My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother or some darker people or some poor hungry people in the mud for big powerful America and shoot them for what? They never call me nigger. They never lynch me. They never put no dogs on me. They never rob me of my nationality and rape and kill my mother and father. What well, I'm gonna go shoot them for what? How can I go shoot them? Them little poor little black people, little babies and children and women. How can I shoot them poor people? I'm just take me to jail. While fighting imprisonment for his stand, Ali was also stripped of his title, denied a license to fight in the United States, and denied a visa to go overseas to fight. He was in a much tighter financial bind than most were aware of. I don't want to see the World Every Champion driving a Volkswagen, guys in the Cadillacs and making fun of you. So I'm working today, I'm holding, right? I'm <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I had one day I had to speak in Canisius. Heard of Canisius? Canisius, Ferdinand Dickinson, C.W. Post. Three colleges and $1,500 a college. Pretty good money. So I broke my wife's piggy bank. Half about, she had about $35 in it. I broke the, no, I'm sorry, $135. I broke the piggy bank to get gas money to get me to the college. And I got enough gas and food money to get the forty-five hundred dollars, the three fifteen hundred dollars, and forty-five would hold me, pay gas bills, light bills, till I get to the next college. <laughs> this went on until the whole mess was over. Inevitably, students would challenge Ali on his stand and his convictions. Remarkably, Ali more than held his own against students who had a far better formal education than he. I'm saying you're talking about me about some draft, and all of you white boys are breaking your neck to get to Switzerland and Canada and London. I'm not going to help nobody get something my Negroes don't have. If I'm going to die, I'll die now right here fighting you. If I'm going to die, you my enemy. My name is a white people, not Vietcongs or Chinese or Japanese. You my opposer when I want freedom. You my opposer when I want justice. You my opposer when I want equality. You won't even stand up for me in America for my religious beliefs, and you want me to go somewhere and fight, but you won't even stand up for me here at home. Very powerful speaker is Muhammad Ali. And this was the situation in that they were trying to get the world champion trying to get a champion boxer to go over there and kill people and he refused it's really interesting in that his job was beating people up that's Muhammad Ali he's a boxer he's Cassius Clay. his job is to punch people and the American government says to him we want you to go over there and kill people and he says no then you can't punch people it's really interesting and it caused a big divide and so we have this thing called the counterculture so the war in Vietnam over in Southeast Asia creates this big split in American culture create this big uh, it creates the counterculture because the counterculture is very different from a subculture so if you just take a sociological perspective uh, let me try this I'm not sure what it will look like but you have uh, let's do it like this. Hi. So you have high culture in a society, you have low culture, and you have subcultures. Now, high culture would be in, in societies that we might be familiar with, high cultures are different everywhere, but high culture might be things like opera and ballet and theater and equestrian yes darling 
It doesn't mean it's better or worse than high culture or low culture, but generally it's aimed at a specific socioeconomic level. So you have the high culture and then you have the low culture, which might be the baseball, which might be the football, which might be the movies, uh, which might be the radio, which might be Nanhon San, Nanhon Jasanda, etc. It's not worse, but it's just aimed at a broader, it's mainstream, it's aimed at a broader thing. And then inside that, you would have the subcultures, and the subcultures might be the stoners, might be the punks, might be the goths, and such forth. But they still exist inside the culture. They're just a subculture. They're in it, they're not the mainstream, they just, they still go around, they still do their things. Counterculture exists outside the mainstream. And it wants to change the mainstream culture. It's counter to this. It's revolutionary. It, it, it's big. And this developed in America as a result. Not directly as a result, but to draw those lines is very difficult. But And you can't say that correlation and causation aren't the same thing. But they're very closely intertwined. And I've always often found it interesting how, let's say in South Korea, these subcultures, you don't see as many of them. If you walk around the university campus, you don't see the stoners and the jocks and the goths. and the, They're not as visible as they are in Europe or in North America. And also this counterculture came up. So this counterculture that perhaps many of you are very familiar with, or rather the values that you're familiar with, the values of anti-war the values of peace the the values of sort of turning up turning over society and, and and getting that that comes from war if there wasn't the vietnamese war or the, the american war the vietnam war then does this turn up because it's counter to something else because it's by its very nature reactionary so if there's nothing for it to react against, maybe it doesn't come. The participants called themselves hippies. The philosophy must be in tune with nature, a free expression of the self. It ties into existentialism, which was sort of a big growing philosophical movement rather than uh, essentialism. It's a big divide between those two. Focus on creating new lifestyles, peace, love, harmony, music, drugs, Eastern religions, hair and clothing styles, sex. These big movements came out of this culture in the midst of the Vietnamese War, in the midst of people rebelling against the American government, the American presidents. Because during the Vietnamese War, there were, I think, three American presidents. Eisenhower, JFK, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon. That's a pretty long war to have four present. Yeah, one was shot, but if you get that's a pretty long war for this to happen. And amidst that, this happened. And also because of that, during the 1970s, rock and television changed as well. So now instead of following traditional values in society, now the music and the television started talking about Things like Rage Against the Machine, things like the Jimi Hendrix experience, things like Jefferson Airplane, things like the Black Panther movement coming up. All of this as a result of that. So this in an Essen politic that we looked at a little bit in Zara Steiner's work last time, some of you picked up on that. And I was really impressed. What they're doing, what America was doing over there in Southeast Asia was having an effect here. And how linked are they? And what if that one is bad, but this one is good? And that's a value judgment, but let's just, just take that as an example. What if that one had bad long-term effects, but this one had good long-term effects? And what if this one only comes with that one? How does that... How does history work like that? How do you piece that together? The end of the Vietnamese War... I always call it the Vietnamese War, sorry, the Vietnam War. Uh, 1973, so pressure gets too much, and, and Nixon eventually 
you get a negotiated settlement, you get the Paris records, uh, Accords. American prisoners of war come out. Some of the American prisoners of war were in Vietnam for eight years. That's a pretty long time to be stuck in Vietnam, beaten all day and, and bruised. Uh, some, some were treated nicely, but there were some moments where the Vietnamese got these uh, prisoners of war and they, they marched them through the town. The North Vietnamese, they marched the American prisoners of the war through the town and uh, they said they were going to kill them. And that then turned the narrative, that turned the global tide against the Vietnamese and back towards the Americans. Hey, like, don't kill those innocent white people, those soldiers, bring them back here. Narrative is really important. Public support for wars is really important. 1975, the South surrenders to the North. Vietnam is unified under a communist government. American troops pull out. The North wins in this story. The North wins. The communists win. Americans lose the war and go home. That's not something that you get in the Hollywood movies. It doesn't work like that too much. Probably Vietnam, Viet, the Vietnam War has the best movies and it has the best soundtrack. Absolutely. But it doesn't have the best story for the Americans. They lose. The communists win. 1975, which is what? We're looking 45 years ago. For you, 1975 is a long time ago. For people my generation, it's, it's a little bit closer. And if you think about it, it gives you the idea that America is... America is not invincible. Or communism doesn't always lose. I'm not saying that I like either of these points. This is not me saying, yes, this is what you must think. But it's to show you that a little historical perspective. Because if you grow up with the Iraq war uh, and such forth, where America just bombs, is in terms of war, this sounds very distasteful. But in terms of war, it's a very boring war in that it's just bombing from a distance and it's over very quickly. Uh, even though perhaps it was illegal and the United Kingdom's involvement in it, there were no weapons of mass destruction found. Uh, so this is not to put a political side on this. But when you go back a little bit, if you have a little bit of historical perspective, perspective, then you'll this becomes second nature. Well, of course, America is not invincible. They, they got their butts kicked in Vietnam. They tried for, for ages and they did some horrible things and eventually they had to leave. When it said they lost... They still killed millions of Vietnamese. So is that... It's not... In terms of who who kills the most, the Americans won. But in terms of who rules the country, who rules the territory, who, who ends up taking control and who has to leave, America loses. And communism wins in this story. This is Pol Pot. Now, Pol Pot uh, took over. Pol Pot was a, a communist that took over Cambodia, and he was inspired by Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution from his trip to China, and he started uh, to try to purify society. So he started try to get rid of Western culture, the life, the religion. All foreign influences were to be gotten rid of. Foreigners were ex expelled. Embassies closed foreign languages banned, really nationalistic, money was forbidden, Cambodia was sealed off. This was a terrible regime. Um, I'll give you a trigger warning. Don't look at the next screen if you're easily upset. Okay, there's, there's a bad picture, but this is what happens. And I'll come back to this one. So don't look if you're upset. This is the killing fields. I thought it would come up. Okay, sorry, here it is. The killing fields in Cambodia, about 25% of the population uh, went. A huge 
amounts of they would kill people for wearing glasses they killed the intellectuals they killed everyone they had to they only liked poor peasants if you showed any sign of intellect intelligence they killed you if you're any kind of foreigner they killed you they killed everyone uh, the killing tree is you can see what it says there that's uh that's a very disturbing thing but a piece of history piece of very real very close rather recent history that's what pol pot was doing now in 1978 because the Khmer rouge which was pol pot's regime in cambodia my pen stopped working because the Khmer rouge they kept sort of coming into vietnam they were they were dangerous they, they were killing everyone in cambodia so vietnam went in the communist vietnam went into communist cambodia and chased out pol pot he he ran out he ran over he ran away to thailand i believe he eventually died of a heart attack but only in about 1989 lived so he wasn't tried for any of that killing field all that horrific death it's 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 really disgusting when you look into the killing fields in cambodia but the point i'm making here is it was the vietnamese communists that got him out it was the vietnamese communists that chased him out and that's a really weird thing to consider because that's communists against communists of course they're different extreme forms the the, the Khmer rouge was a very extreme form and the vietnamese one was different but they're if you never heard of that story before that'll give you a chance to think well so communists fight each other yeah and maybe there's levels of degrees between all of them uh, okay so i'll just go back past these pictures so, sorry so with this vietnamese war the american war how do you tell the story of this because if you look in how, how do you do it how do you communicate this how do you really encompass it where do you start do you have to start in 1840 with the french colonization of uh vietnam do you do you start when they come back in 1945 do you start when the americans enter the war when do you begin and when do you end and what lens do you take do you have to include muhammad ali do you have to include Cambodia? Do you have to include... I didn't say much about the Cold War, actually. Uh, and of course, this was absolutely part of the Cold War. This was the Cold War lived out large. This was modernity or individualism versus collectivism. This was two nuclear powers with the United States and the Soviet Union wanting to be the polar, wanting to be the unipole but afraid to fight each other because of the technology that they possess and some people will say that bipolarity is the safest so if you have two powers opposing each other if it's bipolar during the cold war there was no fighting so it was very safe tell that to the vietnamese tell that to the koreans tell that to the cambodians does that really work like that how do you, if you have a war, let's say you have the Vietnamese war, you have the Vietnam war, how do you tell that story? If you're Max Hastings or if you're a historian, how do you want that story to be told? What do you want to hear as you go through that? In the article that we have, uh, the author, or sorry, the reviewer, Williams Collins, suggests that it's a tragedy for whom? Because the the book is titled an epic tragedy but whose tragedy america's tragedy is vietnamese tragedy or a global tragedy a human which side is that who is the audience of this history so hastings book is aimed at well-informed general readers and is refreshingly devoid of the language of political correctness so do you write different histories for different people because obviously if i'm writing in the newspaper and if i'm writing an academic journal and if i'm writing on twitter uh, if i'm writing in different mediums i change a little bit i can put in different references i use different things because the references i use on twitter might be sometimes different from the references i use in the newspaper or an academic article someone emailed me this week and they said david i don't understand that reference in your newspaper article and i was like oh yeah it's 
a newspaper article. It's not an academic article. Maybe that was a bit too much. Um, so, do you have to tell, excuse me when I do this on itchy eye, do you have to tell different stories of history to different people? The problems of balance particularly emerges in relation to the way the different sides of a conflict are described, hinting at points of a lingering Cold War mindset. Mm. Hastings is particularly fascinated by the figure of Ledouane, whose relentless energy in and out of bed earned him the nickname 200 Candle Power. Drawing on recent revelations by his embittered second wife, Nguyen Thu Nga, Hastings describes Ledouane as totally obsessed by revolution and Marxist-Leninist ideology. Like a character in a rather bad thriller, Hastings describes him as tall, lean, gaunt, his clothes were in rags, chain-smoking incessantly, he seemed to have not thought for anything, save the revolution. A hundred pages later we are confronted once more with the rabid ideological zealot, now displaying a cold lack of concern for those around him, including Nga, who he impregnated with a third child before she was packed off to China. All very true, but the reader might ask how far is this really relevant to understanding North Vietnamese decision-making any more than a probe into the sordid private lives of, say, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, or operatives on the ground in Vietnam like John Paul Van might tell us about the formulation of US policy towards Vietnam during the same period. It's this uh, article that I gave you, this uh, Williams Collins one, to read, it's interesting because it brings apart all these ideas of cultural stereotypes, of political sides left and right, of media responses, of who's the audience, of the moral things. How do you put all this together and tell a story of the Vietnam War? Do you tell it from the right or the left? Max Hastings is English. No, he's British. He's neither Vietnamese nor American. So, does he tell the story from an English perspective or does he tell the story from a neutral perspective? Is it possible in that sense? How is that a valid or does it matter? Uh, a quote from the material says, A restrained and predictably English view, perhaps, but one with considerable relevance for contemporary debate on counterinsurgency. Zara Steiner last week talked about we use cultural stereotypes when we tell history and we do things, and although we shouldn't, they're useful for telling history. That's her argument. That's not my personal opinion. But last week, Zara Steiner said that that's what we do. Here you get you get a couple of them in Williams Collins' piece, actually. Here he says a restrained and predictably English view. So English people have restrained views, apparently. I don't know what she's talking about, because that's a joke. It's a terrible joke. Five minutes on Vietnam and Korea, and then I'll tell you about the midterm and we'll finish. 38th parallel, 17th parallel. Two countries divided, the North are communists, the, the South are capital democracies. North sponsored by the Soviet Union, the South sponsored by America. Now, I'm not sure how much of South Korea's participation in the Vietnamese War is taught in South Korea. But it's always in the international media. So this is March 2020. This was two weeks ago, three, four weeks ago that I saw this. But you see them all the time. And this is from the BBC. 1968, the year that haunts hundreds of women. Why? Because the South Korean people came to Vietnam. We'll get into that in a little bit. But it, it's sometimes about you, you get different versions of history when you go to different countries. Or you get different... Sometimes you don't get the history. So this more is about the, the gaps in history or what's missing. Maybe some of you are sitting there going, yes, I know this, David. I'm not sure. So I'm just introducing it. It's a, it's a fascinating image, though. It looks a bit like James Bond, but a lot scarier. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about this uh, here. It's kind of the James Bond introduction sequences, but it's a little bit Peter Pan. It, um, South Korea sent the second most forces to Vietnam. Britain didn't send any forces to Vietnam. We said, no, that's not a that's not a war that we should be in. So America sent, we've talked about how many forces America sent. At the beginning, I said, what's the Vietnamese perspective? The second most soldiers in Vietnam on the south side were South Koreans. Park Tung-hee sent them. 
um, just to give you an idea uh, of what so this is the Guardian women raped by Korean soldiers during Vietnam War still awaiting apology this is South China Morning Post Moon Jae-in's administration faces call to investigate war crimes amid rising awareness uh, South Korean Vietnam's war massacres time to apologize so this is Korea Herald this is CNN South China Morning Post this is the Guardian in Britain you could find much more 2017 18 19 I can't find the date someone's going there it is David anyway but you'll see a lot of these and this story is is coming more and more so it, it's time I think as well for South Korea to decide what it's going to do with this part of history uh, this is from the BBC article by the way I've, I've just taken out a couple of paragraphs so you can read it for yourself while there has not been an apology for the atrocities perpetrated by the US during the 20-year Vietnam War there has been an acknowledgement in the form of reparations and a damning war crimes tribunal so the US has done reparations they've paid money and they've gone to the war crimes tribunal and said yeah okay but they haven't done an apology but South Korea's government, which now has close economic ties with Vietnam, appears unwilling to engage in a review of its role in the war. Seoul sent approximately 320,000 troops. That's a lot, Sam Shippi Mam Young. In a move analysts say was rooted in a fear of domino effect spread of communism. Also because America said, if you don't send troops, we won't support you. So Park Chung said, right. And Park Chung didn't just send any troops, he sent his best troops, he sent his hardest troops. So whereas America was sending uh, the minorities and the, and the poor white kids, South Korea sent its best, like hardest Marines. Park Chung Yee sent them. South Korea's Ministry of Defense sent a letter to Nguyen and 102 other survivors last September, saying it has no record of any civilian killings carried out by its military in Vietnam, and there needs to be a joint investigation by both governments in tandem to check the facts, but this is currently unachievable. While doing a PhD in Vietnamese history in the 1990s, Khu Su Jong was given a document by an official in Vietnam's foreign ministry describing atrocities carried out by the South Koreans. She believes about 9,000 South Vietnamese civilians were killed in about 80 massacres carried out by the South Koreans, although there is no way of independently verifying her research. The South Vietnamese were on the American side as well because they're all the, they weren't sure that they were spies. So they would kill people in South Vietnam. Two months after her findings were published in a South Korean newspaper article in April 1999, about 2,000 veterans in their 50s, all wearing army uniform, gathered in front of the paper's headquarters in Seoul. The men trashed the building and some also vandalized Ku's home, she says. She and her mother had to move to a high security apartment. The South Korean Veterans Association also attempted to sue her for defamation and fraud, although the case was dropped. Asked for comment, the South Korean government told the BBC in a statement that since establishing formal diplomatic relations in 1992, the two countries have made together continuous efforts to develop their bilateral relations in a future-oriented manner on the basis of the shared view that they should put their unfortunate past behind them and move forward to the future. That's what South Korea is going to do with Vietnam. Put their unfortunate past behind them and move forward to the future. South Korean journalist Ko kyung Tae, who first published research at Kuso Sujong's controversial findings, says the idea that South Korean soldiers may have carried out atrocities doesn't fit with the nation's sense of itself as a victim. We Koreans say that we have 5,000 years of history and we've always been the victim. We've been colonized by Japan, Mongolia, China, and we endured it. It's kind of like we're proud of our victim mindset. South Korea has also spent decades lobbying Japan for a similar apology over the hundreds of thousands of South Korean women forced to work as World War II slaves. South Korea's role in the Vietnamese War is very, very controversial and it's hard to write and discuss the subject. This is a BBC article. There are other articles. I'm not going to say that all of these articles are 100% correct because you know that we're studying what is history and it's really un difficult to understand what is correct. Probably one of the conclusions you've reached is the more we know and the more we discuss, the more perspectives we get, the better we can kind of pull it apart a little bit, perhaps. But I just bring this to your attention because from an external perspective, as an external reader of news and history, the world reads these stories. And uh, it's very interesting, South Korea's role in the Vietnam 
war and the parallels between what's happened and how that story might affect it because because of the results of the Vietnam War perhaps that's not a good thing to be telling in South Korea perhaps I shouldn't have started with the Vietnam War oh well I did um they they want apologies let's leave that uh, you you're welcome to ask me more about that or research more um there's a lot in all of these subjects let's talk a little bit about them in turn this lecture is quite long uh, it has to be long vietnam war is a difficult subject let's talk a little bit about the midterm so if you're asleep wake up so the midterm will be on a friday and um i believe i should have just checked this sorry uh, there will be it will be an open book exam there will be eight questions approximately for you and you will answer for world history is nine o'clock okay so i just had to check that so 9 a.m to 12 p.m and i will post the questions about 8 55 just to make sure there's no problem and there will be about eight questions there might be seven there might be nine you will answer four questions so you have three hours four questions so my math isn't very good but you're looking around 40 minutes i guess 40 20, 40. no less but not an hour less than an hour let's say you have 40 35 minutes okay um the questions imagine there's a question like this How important is ideology in history? And you see that and you're like, Jesus, David, that's a hell of a question. Yeah, it is. There are going to be questions like that. Uh, they're not going to be questions like, when did the Vietnam War start? There will be, obviously, there'll be questions on, there'll be questions on each topic that we've done. Sometimes there'll be two or three. Sometimes there'll be broad ones. Sometimes they'll be focused on the thing. So we get this question, how important is ideology in history? Well, how would you go about answering this? Let me give two ways to do it. And there might be other ways, but I just want to go through two with you. This would be way number one. First, I would go and get some quotes and some definitions. And where would I get them from? Would I type that into Google and get some quotes? No. I would get them from our materials so i would get some quotes and some definitions from our materials so i might go and get gelner maybe car says something about it maybe harari says something about it and, and, and such forth and so i'll go and get some quotes and i'll write them down and i won't just list them that would be wrong but well ideology has always had a long part in history and gelner said this and car said this and harari said this and so i'll say well are they similar or are they different? And then can I kind of conclude or can I come up with my own analysis? But the important thing is that the quotes and definitions and the references and citations I'm using are from our materials. That's really important because that shows me that you've paid attention for the past seven weeks and you're not just getting stuff off the internet you can get stuff off the internet i get stuff off the internet the internet's wonderful but you've got to show that you've tried to understand our materials so if you haven't really paid attention for seven weeks this will be hard if for the last seven weeks you've been paying attention and you've got some notes it will be easier so the test is designed in a way to see how people are going over the last seven weeks it's not memory based though you can use other sources, but the primary materials, please. Videos and readings. Try to reference and cite them. Okay, so that would be one way of going around that question. The second way would be like this. I would come up with a hypothesis. And I would say something like, how important is ideology in history? Well, the more important ideology is the slower 
history travels. It sounds very weird. I'm not quite sure what it means. I put a nice quote on my Twitter uh, today, which said, there are decades when nothing happens. There are weeks when decades happen. That's nice. That's nice. I like that anyway. Time is relative, right? Just like Einstein said. But that's kind of going on that way. So how important ideology is shows how fast and how big things happen. So I'd start with a hypothesis and then I would support it with examples and ideas and references from the text. For example, Gellner said, Steiner said, Carr said, and then I would conclude. There would be two ways of approaching that. Both ways use references and materials. That's the important thing. You can find other ways to do it. But ultimately, you need to be using these our materials and references and citations and answer the question, answer the question. So many students go off on tangents and they don't answer the question. In the team projects, there were people not focusing on the materials. They were talking about COVID-19. They were talking about it's great stuff. It's really good work, but it's not doing the, the work. So I get it. You can put that other stuff in if it fits somehow, but you've got to answer the questions because I have to read it. So um, if you have any more questions or comments, let me know. If you need any counseling or help, please get in touch. Uh, you can get in touch by messages on Blackboard, by emails, by text messages, by phone calls, by Zooms. It's all available to you. There's no problem doing that. If you do get in touch with me and send me messages and emails, please put your group number or your work because when people email me or message me and say David my group project can you check this and if you don't tell me your group I have to search through 25 groups looking for you and I have to click a different page group one no not there group two no just give me the information please that's really helpful get in touch if you need me otherwise good luck I'll see you soon oh last thing just when you thought you were finished there's an open discussion for this week so it's not graded and it's not mandatory but it's there you want to practice, you want to shout off ideas, you want to ask questions, you want me to check something, do it there. It's there for you. It might help you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Goodbye.